All right, welcome to the Eeks Colloquium. Uh, you're in for a special local treat today. Um, before I get to our speaker, let me just remind you that we meet here every Wednesday, same time, uh, same location. And next week, uh, a faculty from CMU, Yasser Sheikh, will be here talking about uh, telepresence and also some work in Oculus. Um, it'll be really fascinating, so you'll want to come to that. You'll possibly experience out-of-body thinking and out-of-location uh, know, thinking due to the telepresence. Um, can you hear me? It's due to the antenna in this microphone. <laughs> you see where I'm headed. Okay. No, but quite honestly, uh, a big part of our communication, we depend on our wireless and uh, the way that we communicate, interact, we rely on these things. And, um, uh, you know, one of the leaders in this field is, is our very own, uh, Professor Eli Ivanovich, and he's also uh, here to tell us a really interesting story about how there's been twists and turns and some critical mistakes and why uh, things have been hopefully solved and run on a better course to that. Um, Eli uh, comes uh, with an amazing uh, body of work. Many of you know the, the fundamental and just uh, radical shifts he's caused in his research and in the entire field. Um, he currently here is the James and Catherine Liu uh, Chair in, in Engineering, and he's the director of the NSF Center for Energy Efficiency Electronic Science. Uh, Science. He, he actually introduced a concept around strange semiconductor lasers, and the idea was that uh, this was actually going to be so fundamentally changed kind of optical communications, and, and indeed it sort of led to that. He has this a way of seeing things that uh, no one else does, and he is very much a rebel in that, in that, in that sense, and he pushes forward those ideas, and then they become this, this sort of well-established practice, and he I'm still, has a lot of these I told you so moments, I think, in his <laughs> career, and I, hopefully he'll share some. Uh, he has, uh, he's the father of the photonic band gap, and also the, some of the early structures that were proposed um, in that uh, part of the research actually are called the Yublanovites. So, so I, I like having these terms these named after you. It's absolutely amazing. He also co-founded Ethertronics, uh, which shipped and uh, is a big contributor to this space of uh, antennas and, and research. And with that, let's welcome Professor Eli Ivanovich. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, just to reiterate uh, that it's good to come every week. And if you do that, then uh, there'll be a seat waiting for you. Last week, uh, many people were turned away. So come early and often. All right, so uh, the topic today, cell phone antennas, it's something that we have all experienced. I'm going to show you some pictures of cell phone antennas. But then it occurred to me that some of you are so young that you don't even remember those types of phones. So let, let me uh, kind of show you. Uh, the, the, <laughs> now, uh, raise your hand if you were not yet born in 1993. <laughs> okay, so about half of you. So you don't remember this. But this is how people showed off in those days. You were really cool because nobody else had a cell phone. So you're really cool. And uh, they had these big clunky ones, which is okay to have a big clunky phone because uh, obviously uh, there's been a lot of miniaturization with Moore's Law. But uh, look at how clunky the antenna was. And the electromagnetics didn't change much. And that, that you can just tell that that's got to be about uh, uh, maybe at least uh, 15, 20 centimeters tall. Uh, so uh, that was the case up to about uh, 1993. And then it got really cool. The small, uh, you know, it, it was good at big one. You can show off to people that you had, a, you had a cell phone and only wealthy people had cell phones. And then the cool thing was the smaller the cell phone, the better. And then you were cool. If you had a big one, it wasn't cool anymore. And so here's a small one, but it still had kind of this thing sticking out. Um, and um, you got to figure, well, you know, they could have done that back in 1993. What didn't they understand? But they went ahead, and this was a very popular phone. Uh, produced in the hundreds of millions. And, um, but two years later, they said that was dumb. And the, uh, the antenna that you had to pull out ended up being this rigid stub, just a small thing that stuck out. That was just three years later. And they completely changed their mind. And they made hundreds of millions of these. And uh, in the course of making it, think about it, they, they had a very big budget. They could hire any consultant in the world to advise them how to design 
the antenna for the cell phone. Uh, and this is what they came up with. But uh, that expert then got superseded two years later. The stub disappeared. And it's more like uh, a smooth surface. This was way superior and made Nokia uh, extremely successful as a company. That was, that was in, in that time, Nokia was like Apple today. It was the dominant uh, company. Uh, so uh, that was, you, you go back and how did these people get it wrong? And it's not like they're, they had no budget or they couldn't afford a consultant or uh, they didn't have a lot of smart engineers, but they were definitely, uh, you can't say it was right or wrong, but they definitely changed their mind every couple of years on what's the best way to do it. So this continued on and uh, actually right around 2000, I sort of said, none of this makes any sense. And I went and I spoke to uh, some of my colleagues who were experts and I said, can you explain this? And I said, no, 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 I couldn't explain it. None of it made any sense. So I thought, oh, great opportunity because I don't have a lot of people in this field who already have it all figured out. And even though I don't know very much about it, I sort of jumped into it. It was a time where it was very easy to raise money was at, and at the peak of the internet bubble. And um, so my company was Ethertronics. And now the truth about these is that they did not perform very well. They just barely met specifications, so they were able to sell them. And so the one in 2005 looks the same. It still has a smooth exterior, uh, but it performed uh, about two decibels better, uh, which, and, and in communications, two decibels is really uh, quite a bit. Uh, so uh, gradually, uh, the, we, we started winning uh, orders and uh, market share. We gained market share, and the company uh, grew bigger. And uh, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about the story of the science behind um, finally figuring out how to do the cell phone antenna right. And up until 2005, uh, the cell phone had existed by then almost 20 years. So it, it took a while to get things right, and, and, but not every company got it right. Uh, so let's move ahead. Oh, for example, companies that did not get it right after 2005 is... Um, uh, I have a video, I'm not going to play the video, but it's, it's kind of heartbreaking in a way uh, because um, Steve Jobs is trying to explain why the iPhone 4 had a bad antenna. And his basic uh, story was, well, ours is bad, but you see the one from Ericsson isn't any good either. And, and then, he, and then he, he, the one from Motorola, you know, that's, that also has problems. So he was making excuses uh, for... Um, um, uh, for the bad performance of the antenna. And it's kind of tragic because you, you see, by the way, he looks, this is a, a still from the video. Uh, he doesn't look that great, does he? And he only had about 13 months left to live. And instead of ha holding this press conference and making a lot of lame excuses, he could have spent time with his children or something. So this is, this is in, in a way, it's very poignant. And uh, this was basically a story uh, we're not perfect. It's not that the iPhone's not perfect. It's, uh, the other people's phones aren't perfect either. And so there, there were uh, problems. So clearly this was, um, uh, this is a field that is uh, fraught with some uh, difficulty. And uh, did anyone here ever have an iPhone 4? Okay, it's the older guys, yeah, okay. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. Like I got a slide with Heinrich Hertz. Okay, Hertz, uh, he, uh, you know, he invented radio. Uh, and I, I am totally in awe of him because I'm saying, well, where did he go to the parts? You, know, you, you couldn't order the parts online. There used to be Radio Shack. You could buy some radio parts at Radio Shack, but that, that, that's gone now. Uh, but in 1888, there was nothing. There was nothing. So how did he actually make uh, the um, uh, radio work? And, and how, did, how did he even come up with the idea? Because it was somewhat contrary. He was looking at Maxwell's equations. And he, he saw the connection with volts and amps and wires. He, he, he saw that connection, and, and he was the first to see that. So his basic uh, trick was the spark gap. That was the, that was the main element. Now, the spark gap, you put a voltage on, and then a spark jumps across. The spark jumping across is a step function of current. If you Fourier analyze a step function, it has all frequencies in it. So he was carrying uh, broadband radio. And uh, so that was uh, kind of nice. And then, uh, so they also had to invent the receiver. So the receiver is shown here. It is basically, again, a spark gap. 
you see these two um, metal spheres and a loop of wire. And uh, you, you, he was able to show that this is not simple magnetic induction, but is uh, very different from magnetic induction. This is another picture of the experiment. A spark goes here, and it induces a spark here. And when I was a graduate student, I did this accidentally. And I was making some sparks. I was a, a laser required a big electrical discharge. And then I held two alligator clips together, and every time I laser fired, I could draw a spark uh, uh, between the alligator clips if they were really close. And uh, I, uh, I accidentally repeated uh, Hertz's experiment. And this led to radio and, uh, and all things. So one of the things to notice, if you look at his receiver, it does look like an LC circuit, right? Because it's got a single loop that's an inductor, and then has between the two, uh, uh, the two uh, spheres, metal spheres, it, you can say that's a capacitor. So the, at least the receiver was LC. And then we're going to find that that part is universally true today. And he did this in 1888, starting with nothing. Uh, of course, today uh, we uh, do this all the time. Uh, we can even do it at optical frequencies, and uh, we can uh, focus optical energy down to a spot. Uh, so in physics, they get very excited whenever you focus a sub-wavelength, but uh, they shouldn't get excited. Uh, in fact, every antenna does that. Uh, the, uh, so for the cell phone, the key wavelength is about this big, and uh, it, all the energy in sort of, like, imagine a volume about this big, and all gets focused down to the first transistor, which is about a micron in size. So there's a treme it's tremendous sub-wavelength. That whole sub-wavelength idea was, uh, it really came from Heinrich Hertz. And you have different geometries work. You can have two spheres, and you have a little uh, hot region in between. So you, and it works at all frequencies. Uh, the ordinary scanning tunneling microscope uh, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize 25 years ago, uh, for b and uh, the frequency at which it operates is 10 kilohertz, which is like hundreds of meters of wavelength. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not unusual. The antenna does concentrate energy. And every one of Marconi's uh, record-breaking radios was concentrating electromagnetic energy to a very small volume. Okay, so uh, how to understand what's going on. So I'm going to uh, give a little tutorial for about 10 minutes. And it's a sort of a recognition that AC circuits are everywhere. So we have all taken AC, our AC class. And we learn, we learn about inductors, capacitors, and resistors. And we know that if you have a, a resonance, uh, you'll have at a certain frequency, uh, omega naught here, let's say, you'll have a resonant frequency, but it's going to have a certain width. And this is like standard stuff that you get with uh, uh, LC circuits. Okay, and I'm measuring here, the, this, I'm plotting impedance between these two points. Okay, so I said, great, LC circuits, hmm, what can I do? So I showed Marconi's, not Marconi's, uh, Heinrich Hertz's uh, receiver was a loop of wire with two spheres, so I've got it here, uh, and uh, I want to see what I can do with that. And it's, it's a loop, so it's, it's a one-turn inductor, and it has the tips are sort of close together, so uh, there's some capacitance there. And I'm going to put the electric charges there. Now, don't be confused that that's electrostatic charge. The way to think about those electric charges is every half cycle they reverse, because these are radio frequency electric charges. So they go back and forth, and they charge up the capacitor. Now, I'm going to start uh, uh, taking the next steps. The next step is that, indeed, the spheres uh, do form a capacitor. So I have my LC circuit. But now I'm going to do some weird stuff. I'm going to start pulling the two capacitor plates apart. So now they're quite far apart. And the electric field lines have to follow a longer path. So maybe the capacitance is smaller, but it's still an LC circuit. And then I'm going to take it to the next step. I'm going to pull the two capacitor plates apart. So one is facing upward and one is facing downward. And the uh, electric fields are still connecting the two capacitor plates. So I would say that's still an LC circuit, OK? And the reason I'm going through this is that it turns out everything is an antenna. And, the, and every LC circuit is an antenna. We are all antennas. I'm going to explain that, OK? So uh, now I'm going to get rid of the capacitor plates. And then I, have, I still have my radio frequency charge. It's oscillating back and forth every half cycle. And I got rid of the capacitor plates because they weren't doing much. So I just got rid of them. And I have a straight wire. 
So a straight wire is also an LC resonator. So if a straight wire is an LC resonator, so is a nail, because a nail is like a straight wire. And if you have a bent nail, that's also an LC resonator. Okay, so you, you can see where I'm headed, is that every piece of metal you ever saw is actually an LC resonator. Interesting. Uh, so uh, let's go a step further. Uh, what about an inductor? So if you buy an inductor, in the old days, we'd buy it off a paper catalog. So I, that's, when I was a hobbyist, that's what I did. And you'd look up and you try to find the, the uh, Henry's you want. You want a certain number of uh, micro Henry's. And you look up, but if, if you're educated, you know, don't just look at the column that has micro Henry's. Look also at the uh, maximum resonant frequency at which it stops being an inductor. And uh, so it, it was, uh, there was an inherent recognition in the, um, in the catalogs where you buy inductors that the, 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 the each inductor is also an LC resonator. And we can see that clearly because at the, uh, uh, the two wires coming out, they, they, could, they could act as a capacitor. And so uh, they, they act as a capacitor and it's an LC resonator. Make sure you operate below that LC resonance frequency and that is an important specification of inductors. But wait a minute, why should I stop there? What about the human being? So imagine that I'm uh, experiencing radio fields, which I am all the time, because we're surrounded by radio waves, and uh, every half cycle my head gets negatively charged, my feet get positively charged, and vice versa the next half cycle. And then my torso, I'm almost two meters tall, so uh, the, um, I have some inductance associated with just my length, and uh, so the human being is all, and I conduct electricity. I have ions in my, in my bloodstream and they conduct electricity. So human being is an LC resonator. So one of the things I ask the students in my uh, electromagnetics class, it's an undergraduate course, I ask them, what is your personal resonant frequency? Okay, and, and they, so I want you to think about that for a little while. In the meantime, your car, your car is an LC resonator. I can put positive charges at one end negative at the other end, and it has some length to it, so it's an LC resonator, okay? Okay, I think we've done metals, and we've done the human beings that conduct electricity. What about dielectrics? So what if I make a, um, a torus, like a bagel, and uh, I make it out of some dielectric, maybe you make it out of silicon or something? And uh, well, uh, when, if you've taken electromagnetics, you know there's such a thing as displacement current, so you don't need to have a metal. You, uh, you can have, if there's any electric field, you at the very ends of the dielectric, uh, there are charges, actually charges developed. And uh, so it starts to look like a one-turn inductor, even though there's no metal. And this is actually true. Uh, a, a dielectric can also be a resonator. And in fact, you don't have to have it in the shape of a torus. It could be in the shape of a cylinder. And uh, you have your displacement current leaves electric charge on the surfaces, the top and bottom surface. And now you see that, that the dielectric objects are also LC resonators. Mm. And the exact shape doesn't really matter. It could be a cylinder or it could be a cube. It doesn't matter. So I think every, so we have metals and dielectrics, so everything is an LC resonator. And people, okay. So uh, being that I'm 1.9 meters tall, my personal resonant frequency is 79 megahertz. And um, it's also, my dielectric constant is kind of high because water has a dielectric constant of 80. So let's, so we have now everything is an LC resonator. Yeah. Hmm. It's kind of interesting. Okay, since everything's an LC resonator, uh, they, there are currents that uh, go back and forth and they have uh, particular resonant frequencies. If it's a straight wire, uh, you start, you can usually fit a half wavelength along a straight wire, uh, or you put, fit two half wavelengths, so that also works. And any random object uh, would then have a whole series of resonant frequencies. So every object you ever saw has a whole spectrum of frequencies that nobody ever talks about. And um, the, uh, this, uh, so the, now the, of course the objects I started with is antennas, and so uh, let me give you an idea of how people measure antennas. This is a very standard measurement with antennas. Uh, you use a very expensive voltmeter. So it's an expensive AC voltmeter. 
and it's called Network Analyzer, and what it does, it sends out AC voltage and it watches what comes back, and usually just a single cable. And it hits the metallic object, uh, and uh, then if you hit a resonance of the metallic object, uh, then some of the energy gets absorbed in the metal, and not all of the power comes back. So typically, this is one really means 100%, so 100% of the power comes back, and then you hit a resonance. The lowest frequency resonance is often the most interesting, but you'll hit the next one and the next one, and these resonances will continue to high frequencies all the way to optical frequencies. So that's kind of interesting that every object has its own spectral fingerprint just based on its geometric shape. Uh, so uh, that's kind of interesting. Now there's a little bit easier way that I figured out how to do this, and that is uh, you, instead of actually connecting a wire to my object, uh, what I do is I put a little loop of wire at the tip of the cable uh, that produces a little AC magnetic field, and then that AC magnetic field excites the resonances of my object, and if it's a, it's, it, the experiment looks the same. You reflect, and whenever you hit a resonance, so you don't actually have to touch the object. You could just be in the vicinity of the object and determine its uh, uh, spectral uh, fingerprint. Um, nobody ever does this, but it's very useful for cell phones. Okay, so w what is the importance? Well, every metallic or dielectric object is a resonator, and then it has resonance frequencies, and therefore it supports AC currents. Now, an AC current in a wire means the current goes, then it, it sort of slows down and turns around. Now, that means that every AC current has acceleration. Now, uh, in physics, that's all they know. They don't understand antennas in physics, but they do know if there is acceleration, that will radiate. So it's, it, acceleration is built into every AC wire, but we don't teach that. We teach AC currents, you've all taken the course, and the professor does not mention at the end. By the way, the, the fact that it's AC means the current has to switch the other direction, there has to be some acceleration. And uh, so every AC circuit radiates some electromagnetic radiation. And then you should ask, why, do, why wasn't that taken into account when I was taught, was taught AC currents? Uh, so, uh, but once you accept the idea that uh, there's a, a, a AC current running back and forth because an LC resonance, it radiates, therefore everything is an antenna. So every object that we have around us, and what I do in class typically, we have a metal chair, I pick up the metal chair, and students, is this an antenna? They say, yes, professor, this is an antenna, <laughs> okay? So every object, it could be a paper clip, could be a metal chair, could be... Uh, uh, it could be a living thing. And, and, it, and since it radiates, it also captures electromagnetic waves. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, so uh, the, now, the way, the way you really, really want to run it, you're very interested in the lowest frequency resonance because it usually looks like this. It's a dipole. You get a very good charge separation. And uh, so it really interacts very well with electric fields because you, you, you separate the positive and negative charges quite well and then uh, the opposite at the next half cycle and so forth. And I'm, this is a technical point about uh, the higher multipoles are kind of useless in antennas because they, there's a lot of destructive interference. So the lowest order th configuration is the, usually the only one that matters. And that's the configuration I show here for the human being. Okay, now suppose you want to, I whetted your appetite and you want to learn more about antennas. Uh, unfortunately, it's not covered well, if at all. So, for example, uh, I was taught from a book that was the Bible for generations of physics students, Jackson's Electrodynamics. And it's really uh, not a good book. I mean, it's a good book. I shouldn't say that. It's a good book. It's a very good book. He was a professor in our physics department, but it's, it's not good on antennas. Yeah, and other things, it's really good. So that's why it was a standard text for a long time. But my education was inadequate because I had a text that said, here's what you need to know about electromagnet uh, electrodynamics, and then there was nothing there about antennas. So that was no good. So I said, well, I fall back to the Feynman lectures. For heaven's sake, what could be better than the Feynman lectures? So much stuff, so wonderful, but virtually nothing about antennas. And uh, Yari's books also... A uh, very excellent set of books. Yari, he's, he's a professor at Caltech. He's written some excellent books, but nothing but antennas. So, uh, 
I co-authored a, um, an experimental paper a few years ago. And the first couple of pages, I said, no, we'll just give a little tutorial so you can look up. It's uh, four years old. Uh, and uh, you can look it up. And there's, there's some important things that are, that are not taught. So for example, uh, it's not every book, or actually some subset of the books, only a subset, tells you how much power a, an antenna captures. So you imagine a plane wave is coming in, and you have your phone, it has a certain size, so I'll pull mine out, and it has a certain size, and then you say, well, does it capture within the area of the phone, or does it, does it capture a bigger area? Uh, actually, ca it does capture a bigger area, and it's a universal number, and it applies to everything. This is a, a surprising fact, that the cross-section is a fixed number. A good, good antenna, bad antenna, it's a fixed number. It's, re it's related to the wavelength squared. And by the way, the atom is like an LC resonating. You can actually uh, assign it. It has a resonance frequency and so forth. And if you, and if you ask, what is the capture, if you ask an atomic physicist, what is the capture cross-section of an atom for capturing um, light from a plane wave? How much will it capture? It will still, it's the same number, lambda squared. And that wavelength is like 1,000 nanometers, and the, and the atom is a fraction of a nanometer. So you, uh, the, the smart atomic physicists know that the atom will capture much bigger than its actual size, like many orders of magnitude bigger. And, and that's sort of known, but they don't connect it to antennas necessarily. Uh, now, this is well covered in a lot of books, is the radiation resistance. And uh, basically, it's the idea that if you have AC current, uh, then the power rated is proportional to the current squared, and then there's some coefficient, and that coefficient has to have units of ohms in order to make the units come out as power. And so that, all that prefactor, all the, uh, the, the uh, complicated units in front end up having units of resistance. That's called radiation resistance. It's uh, very important to know. Okay, but that you can find in, in, um, in more books. Now here's one. Very, very few, very rarely is this covered. It's called Wheeler's Limit. And it's, I would regard this little inequality, it, it tells you the radiation cue to expect. If every object is a, um, an antenna, then you ask, well, how fast does it give up its energy? How fast does it radiate its energy? So, uh, so here's something weird. In physics, it's all about having the biggest cue, but in antennas, you're trying to get the smallest Q because you want the, ener the energy to go away. So it's like a race to the bottom to get to the lowest Q. And, and Mr. Wheeler says, no, no, there's a certain point beyond which you, can, you, you, you uh, unfortunately, you can't get that low Q. And he relates it to the size of the object. So this is a very useful formula. A is the length of that? A is the physical dimension of the structure. The, the, uh, it's the biggest physical dimension of the structure. So uh, this is what Wheeler says, basically. Um, he says, what cue to expect? So let's say you have a really good antenna, okay, and it accepts over a very broad range of frequencies, and it captures energy, uh, wavelength squared. Then let's say you have a paperclip, and it's not really designed to be an antenna. It's designed to be a paperclip, and so it's not a very good antenna. So what do you give up? And I told you that the cross-section was universal. So what you give up is bandwidth. So this is very surprising. You end up with a high Q structure, but you don't want a high Q structure because when you're using your phone and somebody calls you, you don't know what channel he's coming in on. So your antenna had better cover the whole band. Okay. So you, you're, if it's narrow band, it's a failure. It, it won't be able to uh, capture the incoming calls. And there, you, know, you have to meet certain specs and so on. So the pen, the, in antennas, the penalty is bandwidth. You, you, get, you get narrow bandwidth, and it's bad. And the, the Q is high, and that's bad. So here's Mr. Wheeler. Uh, he was a, um, a famous radio engineer in the first half of the 20th century. He went to school at George Washington University, and he got summer jobs at NIST. And it was the early 1920s when radio was get, getting going, and he, and he was like, Today, you know, there was a time when only teenagers really understood how computers worked, and uh, he was a, a time when he was a teenager. He had to explain to the older people how radio worked, and uh, so so he's a very smart guy. Many achievements, and uh, here's his formula, and it's right here. K 
can't quite make it out, uh, but it's basically the same formula. And he, he must have figured this out during World War II. So he did a lot of important war work. So the generation that truly understood antennas were the engineers of World War II. And um, uh, th uh, th these were like the ones who did uh, things other than radar. Radar was done at MIT, at the MIT Radiation Lab, and they were the ones who wrote the books uh, like Jackson's book, and, th and they understood nothing about antennas. But uh, uh, the people, he had no, he had no um, PhD, so maybe that's why they never invited him there, but he did, he did important things during World War II. And, and before and after as well. Uh, so there is a, a derivation. I'm a little reluctant to actually go through it, but it's, is this an easy derivation? I mean, it's like a, literally a back of the envelope derivation. So you express the Q, there are a number of ways of expressing Q, and you express it this way. Here you put in radiation resistance and capacitance. Capacitance, you can always estimate. So this is a great skill. Look at an object, estimate its inductance and capacitance. It's not hard because the capacitance just depends on the length of the object. If I give you a one centimeter wire, I know it's about one picofarad. And you, once you make those estimates, you can figure out the, um, the resonance frequencies. So you put all this together and you end up with an expression for Q. And uh, it's the, um, uh, it is amazingly, and oh, this is how to think about the simplest antenna, the dipole antenna. You have two arms and there's capacitance between the two arms. So that's very straightforward. And finally, you end up getting his formula, uh, three lines into the back of the interval derivation. So let's do something cute here. What, how big do I have to make it to use it for a cell phone? So the American cell phone band is given there. And uh, it has a band with about 80 megahertz. So I need a Q11 so I can plug into Wheeler's limit. How big does my antenna have to be? And you see, it's okay to give up uh, Q, because you, it's, you don't need a Q of 1, a Q of 11. And then you say, well, where did the Q of 11 come from? It came from the Federal Communications Commission, which means it came from the U.S. Congress. So it's not a constant of nature by any means. It's just legally defined. And uh, so you, you plug in numbers, get the cube root, and it says, yes, you can do it in a cell phone because it only has to be 7 centimeters long. Okay, and this is an application of the Wheeler limit. Okay, now there's a, another way to get the Wheeler limit that I'm fond of, and it's the way we, all we were all taught. Q is energy stored over energy lost in one cycle. Now, of course, we want to lose the energy because we want to radiate it away. We have AC currents, we want, we want radiation. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, the energy lost in one period is the radiated power uh, times the, le the length of the period, and so it's uh, energy stored over power radiated. Okay, so that's Q. So let's say we have our good antenna, and there it is. That's about, that's about the best antenna you could make. But once you make it and you put it into a cell phone and bad things start to happen, and you put in some extra capacitance, and that extra capacitance stores energy, but it doesn't necessarily help in uh, radiating. So you end up with this situation. So let's say right around the middle, you get very little charge separation, not like the ends of the wires where you get wonderful charge separation, good radiation. The charge you store toward the center of the antenna is kind of useless because it stores energy, but it doesn't have enough charge separation to radiate. And so what happens is that uh, you end up with um, uh, a Q that is too high because you've stored energy that you didn't need to store, okay? And uh, so you have, um, uh, you've, uh, you've, your performance is, is, could be significant, significantly worse. So I'll give you an example of the cell phone in 2000. The biggest seller in 2000 was this Nokia phone. And you take it apart and there's a circuit board in the phone so there's, and I, I just took the circuit board out so you can see it more clearly. And then they have something they call the antenna, which is a, a piece of metal sitting above the circuit board. So you look at that and say, well, it's not so bad because I have negative charges on that piece of metal. On the ground plane, I have positive charges. They're quite far apart. Uh, I have a big uh, electric dipole that oscillates. That's good. But what is this capacitor doing for me? Absolutely nothing. That capacitor stores energy, uh, but doesn't radiate. 
So this is the mistake in the Nokia phone. Now, um, and they were very difficult to deal with because I made a sales trip to Finland and uh, they were very sure of themselves. But at that time, I hadn't figured this out yet, so I, did, I didn't know what to tell them. But there, there's a simple solution. If, you, if you're going to reduce the stray capacitance, you, this, this metal thing that they call the antenna, you just put it off to the end. And then there's, there's uh, less capacitance uh, between uh, the, uh, this, this part and uh, the uh, ground plane. So it, it, there's a series of tricks to do to reduce the capacitance. And so uh, my, my company, Ethertronics, figured that out and they introduced it. Uh, and I'd love to show it to you, but it's, it's under the plastic because uh, the, the Samsung phone, all the stuff was covered in plastic. So I, I, I can't show it to you without taking it apart. But uh, Steve Jobs, the reason he had trouble with the iPhone 4 is he had a great idea, which is actually I had the same idea, which I used to pitch to the investors, is that the antenna will eventually become the skin of the phone and therefore cannot be a commodity. And uh, so uh, we were selling to Samsung, we were not selling to Apple. But uh, the, um, uh, I didn't know whether Apple really understood this scientific principle I just showed you. But when the iPhone 6 came out, I said, they got it, okay? So here's how I know they got it. Uh, Steve Jobs wanted the whole surface to be metallic but then, what's he doing with this thick layer of insulator in between? Here, and another one here. Why, why did he tolerate that thick layer of insulator? Okay, it's kind of strange. Uh, in fact, uh, this, if anyone remembers what their iPhone 6 used to look like, it, uh, this is a picture. And you say, well, the things at the, t at the ends, these are the antennas at the ends. Okay, so it's more or less the design I showed you. Is put the antenna at the end, not on top of the circuit board. That part's good. But how much AC voltage are you going to put on the antenna? Well, I can tell you it's about one volt AC. So why do I need two millimeters of insulation? You don't need two millimeters of insulation for one volt. So they did this for a reason. And when they did this, I said, ah, they got it. Because you need these two millimeters of insulation to reduce that stray capacitance that I was talking about. So they, they figured it out. And it, they were doing it right. Uh, so uh, that, uh, uh, that was uh, quite a, you can just see it on the outside of the phone, so it was very nice, you didn't have to take anything apart. Uh, this is, and then the, of course the real antennas are multi-resonant because they have to be the basic cell phone band at 900 megahertz, then the, uh, the PCS band at 1.8 gigahertz, uh, the uh, GPS at uh, 1.55, uh, gigahertz, the Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz, and the second Wi-Fi band. So, so it's multi-resonant. So you end up, uh, this is what the uh, phones uh, look like. Uh, you said this is a plastic corner of the phone, and you see there's metal here, and it's just some very strange shape. And the reason it's a strange shape is that you want it to be resonant at a whole bunch of different frequencies. So you, you have some weird shape. It's amazing how they make this. They use a laser to write these patterns. Uh, there's a little tiny bit of tin inside the plastic. The tin is a catalyst for electroplating. Uh, and after you've zapped this, these patterns with a laser, you dip it into an electroplating bath, and it comes out nice shiny copper when it comes out of the electroplating bath. And this is before you metalize. You can't even see that anything has happened. It's, um, it's only after you start metalization that you start seeing these oddball patterns. And the, the thing about these patterns is that if you change them by one millimeter, the frequency shifts, and now the phone stops working. Okay, so you, it, it, it's a modest amount of precision, but you do have to get it right. And uh, this is uh, just to show you roughly how big it was. Okay, so uh, I've pretty much told you how to make a good cell phone antenna. Uh, the, um, we go back to Heinrich Hertz. This is where we started. And it's, uh, you look back, it's still unbelievable that he figured this out and also figured out how to do it when there were no radio parts available. Um, but the loop of wire is, is an LC circuit. It's also an antenna. Uh, the, um, uh, this structure with the metal plates, it's also an antenna. Anything, anything could be an antenna, but you have to do it right to get the maximum performance. Uh, so this is uh, what happened to my company. So uh, we started beating the competition, uh, and uh, the, 
the way it worked is that uh, uh, they would test it. So Samsung uh, always held us at arm's length and they tested everything, they didn't trust us. And they would compare it to the competition and we were uh, always a couple of decibels better than the competition. So they said, uh, congratulations, you get the order. But uh, then said, oh good, oh, we're two decibels better than the competition, why don't you pay us per decibel? <laughs> and they said, no, 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 you get the order. You met the threshold, if you exceed the threshold, you get the order. You don't get paid extra. So um, that's the problem in dealing with a powerful company. But uh, on the other hand, the volumes were kind of amazing. So over a period of time, we shipped uh, two billion antennas, which is uh, unbelievable and uh, represents a, uh, about a quarter of the human race. So the thing that you actually shipped, what did it look like? It's uh, the one I showed you here. Oh. It's like this. Oh, of course. Yeah, this is the, uh, this is the, the Ethertronics uh, product, and you can just take a part of Samsung phone, and you will see this. Cool. Okay, and so we have some immediate conclusions, is that all objects have a characteristic electromagnetic spectra based on geometrical shape, but nobody ever talks about it. So each of us has a, a spectrum that can be measured. I showed you how to measure it. And if you, uh, if you do the geometry very well, you form a low Q antenna. Remember, that's good. Low Q is good. And uh, then is, is this important? Well, it, it, the volumes are huge. Um, so it is kind of important because it's something that everybody carries with them, OK? And so what I've described is the antenna physics until uh, 2019. So the cell phone has generally been smaller than the electromagnetic wavelength. So I have here a picture of an electromagnetic wavelength, a picture of a cell phone. And yes, you get all these interesting things, Wheeler, Wheeler's limit, and because the phone is smaller than the wavelength. But there's a big change coming next year, 5G. So uh, there are many important differences with 5G. By the way, 5G is not one thing. 5G is many advancements that will roll out over the next 10 or 20 years. And they will call it 5G from the very beginning, but there'll be uh, more and more advancements. Now, uh, one of the advancements is to use higher and higher frequencies. And so uh, they're gonna go as high as 60 gigahertz. At, and uh, uh, as soon as you go above about five gigahertz, the wavelength, this is meant to represent the wavelength, is now smaller than the cell phone. And so everything changes. So all the physics that I just told you is for the previous world where the cell phone was smaller and it was hard to get a, get a uh, low enough Q. Uh, when the uh, wavelength is smaller than the cell phone, the uh, physics is very different. So now the cell phone is the big thing and the wavelength is a small thing. For one difference is there is room for multiple antennas. So multiple antennas is called MIMO. And if you walk around in Corey Hall, and pr I'm pretty sure also in Soda Hall, you look up at the ceiling and you see the Wi-Fi transponders on the ceiling. And, uh, oh yeah, here's one. But you, can't, you can only see the three antennas. You see the three antennas sticking down? There's another three sticking up. There's six of them. And so that became part of Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, the, it, uh, the, the great thing about Wi-Fi, the, uh, it's an unlicensed band, so they can, they can do any standard they want. It's, it's going to take decades, but it's finally, uh, the, the use of multiple antennas is going to go into cell phones, but all the, every international country has to agree. Uh, so they're, they're going to agree in due course. So you'll have, uh, in, you'll have room for multiple antennas. Uh, they will be adaptive, and the, the way to think about them being adaptive, it's not going to be like beam steering at all, uh, what it's gonna be like is you'll send out some kind of weird radiation pattern. It's gonna interfere constructively and destructively. And in lasers, we call that speckle. This is what speckle looks like in lasers. lasers. There's hot spots, cold spots. And what the phone is going to do is going, instead of steering, it's going to adjust all the phases so that you'll get constructive interference exactly at the receiving antenna. And they're already doing that uh, with respect to the base station. So the base station already has many, many antennas and uh, they're not exactly beam steering. What they're doing is they're creati creating a speckle pattern such that uh, the, uh, uh, the customer sees constructive interference at his location. So uh, it's uh, kind of interesting. And then it also shows the unity of all different fields, laser speckle, 
has an, you, so you need to know language. So it's, it's, in radio, it's called fading. It's exactly the same effect. So that's looking backward, and now we're looking forward, and so we know what to expect. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. All right, uh, is this on? Okay, great. Uh, questions? The antenna is working. Oh, yes. Oh, making it rough. Could I? Look out. I don't know about that, Rodney. Not the best. Uh, you, you were talking about how everyone is, a, is an antenna, and um, I, I've heard stories occasionally about people who have uh, an odd filling in their teeth, and they can hear a certain radio station. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how that's, that's possible. Um, uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, w I wouldn't necessarily rule it out, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm reminded of uh, great art. So I think of um, uh, the uh, Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, and uh, you have uh, uh, God is, uh, or Adam is reaching out his finger, and God is reaching out his finger, and there's almost, they almost touch each other. And so you, it's sort of like uh, thinking, uh, thinking about uh, how uh, even back then there was this uh, spark, uh, the spark of uh, mortality and, and humanity uh, that appeared in the, in the great arts. But uh, yes, if you reach out, you're a different kind of antenna. For the last part, you mentioned the uh, base station is actually creating an interference pattern for individual users. Yes. Is that customized for each user? Absolutely, yes. So, um, uh, and so I, let me give it its name. Uh, this has been commercial for uh, several years now. It's called, instead of being called MIMO, so MIMO is multiple input, multiple output, which means you have to use multiple antennas at both ends. And uh, with each antenna you add, you, you get corresponding amounts of bandwidth. So for example, this is how you have an 80 megahertz Wi-Fi band. That's the lowest Wi-Fi band, 80 megahertz. But you can get a data rate of uh, 500 megahertz. And uh, the, uh, so the way you do that is uh, by having multiple antennas. Each, multiple, each antenna goes through a different spatial channel. And so it's like having uh, many connections at the same time. Uh, so that was MIMO, and massive MIMO is a further, uh, uh, further improvement uh, where it was noticed that if you have a great many antennas, you can kind of focus the energy where you want it. Uh, but it's not focusing in the sense of steering a beam. It's focusing in the sense of adaptively adjusting the phase shifts of multiple antennas so that they all arrive in phase at the, uh, uh, at the customer and uh, the customer sees a strong signal and in reverse uh, sends a, a, a stronger signal. So that's actually already in use. It's, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, so you showed an antenna, uh, you, showed, you showed Ethertronic's patented design of their antenna. Uh, th that loop of wire is clearly smaller than seven inches. So what, what tricks are they playing to uh, change the resonant frequency? Let's see. Oh, yeah, okay, this is a good question. So let's show that thing. Here it is. Okay, so clearly this is just occupying a small corner of the phone, and so it's, you'd think it would be too small. So the way you have to think is that it's not the structure that you see that's the antenna. It's the entire phone is the antenna. So this is sitting uh, adjacent to a ground plane. So there's a ground plane here, and if this builds up some uh, positive charge, let's say on these wires, it builds a positive charge, the negative charge is gonna be way at, it'll be distributed along the length of the ground plane, and some of it will be way at the other end of the phone. So the way to think about that seven centimeters is, is that is your minimum size of phone that uh, you could tolerate. And luckily, we can do that very easily, and so we never really needed those things sticking out. And so they, they, those things sticking out uh, disappeared. Okay, and, and you can see it in the iPhone 6. This is the antenna. You, you put, let's say, negative charge here. Well, there's positive charge all through here if there's negative charge up here. And so 
So how big is the electric dipole? Oh, it goes from one end of the phone almost to the other end. And then uh, in case uh, the, uh, uh, there's fading on that signal, uh, it also has as a backup, it has the other antenna. So that became pretty standard um, quite a while ago is that uh, it's, um, you don't want to rely upon one antenna because every now and then you have destructive interference and the signal will drop out. So you, you toggle back and forth whichever one is giving you a stronger signal. That's the old primitive form of uh, antenna diversity. And then it, it is gradually now being replaced by MIMO. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, how do you deal with all of the extra resonances and dielectric constants and so forth that are introduced by the user handling the phone in various that, unpredictable ways? That is a great question. Uh, and uh, just to uh, imagine, this is a uh, LC resonator. I said that, right? I put my hand on it. It's a different <laughs> LC resonator. So this is one of the greatest challenges in designing for an antenna for a cell phone is that you have to make it extraordinarily tolerant of geometrical changes like that. And uh, so it's, it's part of the, um, uh, part of the um, uh, design uh, process uh, to do that. And that, that's where the iPhone 4 went wrong. Uh, you would grab it and it would be completely different. That should not have happened. And uh, now Apple is a very secretive company. And I, I've asked numerous people, uh, and they say, well, I can't, I can't talk about it. They, they can't talk about it. what went wrong. Because in the normal flow of events, uh, they would have picked up that it wasn't going to perform well. And that somebody would have double checked it. Okay? But Steve Jobs was adamant that the external skin should be the cell phone. Excuse me, should be the antenna. The, the metal that this, he wanted the, for the looks of it. He wanted the exterior of the phone to look metallic, whereas other companies had it as plastic. And um, it's a, it is a correct idea, but you don't put it on, on a short deadline on a flagship product. You put it onto a, a smaller selling product just to see if everything works out, or you run enough tests. And the, the thing about Apple is that they were not buying from Ethertronics because this, it influenced the appearance of the phone. They couldn't delegate that. They had to do that in-house. But in-house, you don't have your checks and balances. To an exterior company, you don't trust them. You check everything uh, that they uh, give you. So if someone wasn't checking, I don't, I've never heard a uh, authoritative story on uh, how they made that mistake. So for the iPhone 6, could you please, so could you please explain a bit more about why increasing the gap would decrease the capacitance? Do we see the top part and the middle part as like the two plays for the capacitance? Capacitor? Yeah. Yeah. Let Let's see if I have it here. Yeah. So this is supposed to be the explanation. So you have two pieces of metal very close together. If they're very close together, obviously you have more capacitance. But that capacitance, just where the two metal parts meet, that capacitance doesn't radiate. It's not helping you. It's, it's storing energy in a useless manner. So for that reason, you want to reduce the capacitance around the middle. You want to look more like that. And that's what happened to the iPhone 6. So they pulled the two pieces of metal apart by two millimeters. And uh, I would say that was a non-obvious thing to do. So I could look at the iPhone 6 and say, um, they understand what they're doing. Thank you. Without complaining about how iPhone 4 did it wrong, can you answer his question about how you did it right? Um, how do you deal with variable capacitance from oh, people variable holding capacitance. the phone? Oh, variable capacitance. You know, we had some really smart people in the company. I was just... <laughs> <laughs> The, um, uh, they, they, had, they had figured out how to do this, and they, uh, they had an expert system so that uh, an, un uh, an engineer who wouldn't necessarily understand everything could still design the antennas for the phones. But basically, uh, you can imagine that, uh, uh, let's say you have a resonator. 
there, if you put dielectric in a certain spot in the resonator, you'll shift the frequency. But there are other spots where you won't shift the frequency. So a lot of it is tailoring the local fields around the resonator so there is not much field strength where you're likely to grab it. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, the iPhone 4, they put the fields exactly where you're going to put your hand. Uh, so that, that, that's more or less uh, the way they did it. I hope that satisfies you, Chris. Your heart to satisfy. <laughs> All right, I, I, I had a question too. Yeah. So the the talk was very much around some of the the challenges and the yeah. problems and where things misstepped yeah. and the, the like. We heard about the iPhone four and how it was this like had these flawed designs. But another reading of your talk is really uh, a roadmap to opportunities to use antennas for things they weren't, we don't traditionally think of them used for. I mean, certainly you could claim that the iPhone 4 antenna gate was a very, well, not so good, but it was a, it was a touch sensor. I mean, you knew if someone was grasping the phone, <laughs> just right. gate, maybe not the right way to design it. But yeah. when I think about that, I think about where we might be missing and maybe we put antennas and the design thinking in, in a one particular category, maybe it really should be thought more broadly as ways that it interprets signals and bouncing and all, it's like it could be so much richer part of design across all of computing and, and electrical engineering. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. I agree completely. Uh, you know, we are surrounded by RF now. That's, we live with RF. Morning and when we sleep, we have the phone next to the bed. Okay, I have my smartwatch that's uh, Bluetooth connected to the phone, and uh, I'm 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 a kind of insecure person, so I, I have a second watch. <laughs> uh, it's just the beginning. Uh, the um, the thought is that uh, we we will all be fully instrumented with a local area network, so our physiology will be tracked from birth to death, on this on the chance that someday doctors will be able to interpret that information. Why not? We just so wealthy people store the information. Why not? Uh, so I, I, we, it, it'll just be everywhere, and it'll uh, it'll uh, be a part of uh, human existence. Will be to be surrounded by these sensors and these instruments, and all wirelessly connected. So it's the brave new world. All right. I want to I want to thank you for 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 the talk today, and actually for all of you. Uh, I, I'm always really, i just fascinated by the work that you do. And I also realized if you get caught off guard without a Halloween costume on, you can tell people, I'm an antenna. So you can tell <laughs> All right. Thank you, Professor Yablonovich. Thank you. Thank you.